Hello and welcome to the live show here with myself, Shane Stilton, joined by Martin Story today and brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. If you want to get maybe this class Wexford jersey, which I'm sure Martin is admiring there, or any of these jerseys <laughs> on screen here, you can get 15% off with the promo code or game. Actually, what, um, what do you think of when you see this jersey? Is there any player or time you think of? Sure, it's the original, like, you know what I mean? To me, it's what, it's what the Wexford jersey should be. That's the way it is, like, you know? Yeah, do you mean sponsor free? The yellow bellies when the belly was purple, like. But anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> it was it was a big weekend for for Owlert. I mean, we're going to talk about all the different hurling going on at the moment. But the twenty twenty All Ireland Club Camogie final delayed, obviously, was played, and uh, Owlert, who won it in twenty eleven and twenty fourteen, to come back and beat the reigning champion Sarsfields uh, four eight to two nine down at Nolan Park. Jeez, uh, that was a great performance. Absolutely. I mean, I'd say, that, and I've been with him and watched him all along, I, I reckon it was probably one of their best performances ever, really, like, you know, because, and what and had to, like, the girls are, it was a good few of the girls getting older, like, you know what I mean? I know the average age when you bring it down, but, like, there's a good few of them, of them gone over the, uh, gone over the 30 mark and children and everything, but see, I suppose they're playing for enjoyment now rather than, rather than anything because it's probably a bonus territory now when you get a bit older like and you, and you win something you know and who are the people that are driving that team sorry who, who are the people that are driving that older team but sure i mean it, it, it's literally parish driven i mean right you have colin sunderland and kevin kennedy and james dial and um, rory jacob is doing the coach and ray harris is doing the physical Bridge of Morn is doing the first aid since I'd said 25, 30 years. Like, you know what I mean? But like the girls know the girls know how important it is to the parish. Like, if you know what I mean, if you just take Stacey Kyo, for instance, got married on Friday, like and, and the All Ireland final was bigger than our wedding, really, for her, if you know what I mean, and for like and that's the way she was looking at like we were talking, we talking her saying, Jesus a pity. I know she was grand that the Jesus once we win on Saturday is the main thing. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? That's that's the way it was like yeah and I, I believe they were all just sipping my waddies and seven ups and stuff like that at the wedding it, it must have been surreal yeah well kira was at it like and kira was home here by nine o'clock and yeah that's that's how i know like you know what i mean no but they have i mean they're so used to being committed to to camogie from the time they were 10 12 years of age like that they know exactly what it was takes but i mean like I went up yesterday for a couple of hours, and I mean, they, they were letting they were letting the hair down, and they were letting rip. Like you know what I mean? That's the other side of it. Like you know, what do you like when you're watching Kira out in the field playing in these matches? Me? No, I, I I'd always be uh, I'd always be encouraging on the sideline. I'd always be shouting support all the time. Like you know what I mean? I I I'm never a person that had to be given out on the sideline. I I don't give out because I made so many mistakes myself in me playing and used to hate people over the teams giving out to me. I used to just hate it. So I, I always swore that if I was over a team, if I couldn't find something good to say, I'd say nothing. Like you know. But I are you nervous? Right? When I'd be over a team and I go, <laughs> and then you go back and say, "Well done, hard luck, next ball." Would you be a nervous wreck though when you're watching? No. 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 How come? Because some people would find it very nervy. I would have found it nervy watching family members. No, I, I, I just, I mean, I just absolutely really enjoy it. Like, and you'd be, you'd be watching for the space and you'd be nearly shouting where to hit the ball and look who's making the run. She'd be so, I'd be so caught up in watching it that it wouldn't be nervous. You'd be trying to, like, you'd be often shouting, Kira, get back, number 14 has gone in the back. And Kira would be playing centre-back and it wouldn't be a hard player, but you'd see someone in the back and you'd shout, like, is there someone after slipping in there if there's a quick ball in? That's, that's I'd be just watching the mechanics of the game, like. So, did you think once the, you know that early great start and getting goals on the board early on, did you think right we're in a good spot here, or do you think there's plenty of time and you know there was maybe mistakes for those goals that Sarsfields did score? But were you confident that Owler had see it out? I was because it's very seldom, it's very seldom a team of Owler's caliber in the Camogie is going to lose a nine point lead. Like if it had been five or six, it was attainable, it was achievable. Like one goal and it's back to a one goal game. But, like, you're not going to score three goals, I think. And, I mean, that puts it down to one six, which is seven scores, or or two three, which is two majors and and three pints. Like, you know, I, I, I just don't think the the other team is going to go asleep to allow that much of a 
that much of a lead slip. Like, I know the Sarsfields are a brilliant team, and I would have been worried if I had been a five, six point lead. But when I went to eight and nine, I was just thinking, no, that we'll see this out once we can keep taking over the scores ourselves and not go ultra defensive. Like, and we didn't, we kept attacking. Like, mm. and Una Lacey's, I mean, her knee is bandaged up. So she's obviously not at a hundred percent playing there. I think is it no cartilage you need her knee and still goes and scores a hat trick in an All Ireland. Yeah, but Ona's crock, but Ona's been crock now for five or six years, <laughs> and it doesn't matter. She's a she's an absolute goal machine. Like I mean, we call her the bomber. Like you know, so it's it's it's. I'd always let the roar after she gets the goal. The bomber. You see her looking out to as much as saying, "Now you you stop." Like you know, but <laughs> no, Ona just has the ability. She has that ability to, to score goals. And I mean, we will find it very, very difficult to replace Una Lacey when she goes for the ability. I mean, I reckon if I reckon in this year's championship, Una could have scored 12, 14 goals since the, the you know what I mean, the, the club championship started or whatever. Like, you know, I mean, that's 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 phenomenal. Like, you know, yeah. And, you know, obviously with with Owler getting relegated in the hurling. Have the like has there been a huge focus on on the ladies team? I mean, is is it supported just as well as the men's? Because obviously in an awful lot of parishes it is. Oh yeah, it, like I mean, like the hurling camogie, it 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 be brother and sister, bread and butter. Like you know, the, the like the girls get the pitch the same as the men. That's it. Like there's no one have rights to it. It's 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 no no no. The camogie is huge and always has been in Owler to Ballot since since I'd say the last 25, 30 years. Like it has been. I mean, the girls have achieved way more than the men. If you go and check their track records, they, they won four, three or four fail, five failures in a row. Like, the, their, the girls' track record is phenomenal. Like, And can they go again now? Because the, the 2021 club championship is, is going to kick into gear fairly soon. I think it's March is when the final is going to be. Well, they, they're, they're scheduled to play. They're scheduled, I think, the, the Leinster semi-final between Jude's and... And um, Kilkenny Championships, the name's gone on me. It's, gone, it's just at the bottom out of my head. Um, they are playing, I think, the second last weekend in January. And then the Leinster final is scheduled for the last weekend, I think, in January. And then it'll be semi final and final if, if they can get. But, like, I would, the girls are in a great position in the sense that they're in good shape. They're coming on a high. They're coming into Christmas. So they're going to have a couple of weeks of letting the hair down, having a real good time, enjoying it. There'll still be a bit of celebrity status around about him. And then they'll go back in training in January and they won't have lost, like, you know what I mean? They won't have lost training time as such. They'll be only taking a two-week break and they'll be back in. Mm. And when you're successful, you never, ever, ever worry about training. It's only when you're losing and not going well that training becomes a, a, a sort of a chore and, oh, God, we're training again tonight. Whereas when you are winning, you can't wait to get up the field to meet the rest of the players to have a bit of crack and a bit of slagging and a bit of messing, like, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, a couple of comments in Richie English says, uh, congratulations to Owlert and Martin's uh, daughter, Kira on becoming All-Ireland Senior Camogie Champions up Wexford. Joe Butler says, Owlert were tremendous on Saturday, fully deserved their win. Great to see Camogie nowadays with the new rules. No hand pass goals, no drop into Hurley, some physicality restored. Uh, needs to be marketed more. It's a fine game. Do you, do you go along with that? Do you like the way those, uh, those rule changes have brought in a bit more physicality? And I think the, the lack of drop into Hurley means there's more skill now too. Absolutely, but I always reckon that that camogie is a lot more physical than 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 the hurling anyway. I mean, the hits in camogie, the, the, like the, the the women won't take a step backward at all. Like you know no. what I mean? There's absolutely they're, they're, when they go out, like they're, they're, it's it's hell for leather. Like and I I think a good camogie match is near enough as good as a good hurling match. Like you know what I mean? It's 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 probably a little bit more direct still and it's not maybe as as possession orientated and as possession based as Harlan has. So I think it's still a little bit more pure, maybe I do. There's a lot yeah. more direct ball. Well, I suppose when you have Ola Lacey in there, it's easy to play in direct ball and, and earth play, like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So can I just ask you then um, about the, very briefly, the Owler team getting relegated this year. Can they bounce back? Is it, you know, it's, it's not too long ago since they, they beat our Kula team in the Leinster final 2015. Like, do you see the team bouncing back or is it, you know, you see the likes of Portumna and maybe a great crop comes, but it's a small area and when that crop goes, it's, it's hard to get back. Well, that's what it is with us as well. I mean, we have a tiny area, like, and, and I mean, we've been at the top for a long time and, I mean, I suppose we weren't competing in the Premier in the Premier on the Rage for a good few years, but we have a good crop coming now at 16, set down to, we say, 12 or 13 again, and it's coming, like, you know, but 
But when you're from a rural and a very small area, you often go in leaps and bounds like that. Like, you know, I mean, we, and we were very, very unlucky to be relegated. I mean, we meet, we beat St. Martins and I think St. Martins on their day is as good as team, any team, club team in Ireland. And we just meet them on a day that we just couldn't, we, we, we couldn't deal with them. And the new system, I suppose the new system this year where we're unlucky because we, we were last year, in 2010, we were in a we in a pint of a county final, and with four players injured going into the Harriers match, and there's only three in a group now, and with four players going into the Harriers match, and we got beaten, four injured players, and we conceded a goal when we beat Ratnor in the group stage to only win by three, and if we had a one by six, we'd have topped the group. Like that's how small the margins were, and we'd have been going automatically into a quarter finals and not into relegation. And like, I mean, that's how how tight the margin was, like you know, for relegation. And then we drew, and then we drew Saint Martin's, who were also in it. And and like, I mean, we just weren't good enough on the day for them. But to answer the question, Jane, um, I think it's going to be very very tough to bounce straight back because I'm I'm, I'm coaching with Timon Cameras in in the intermediate for the last couple of years. And it's going to be really, really tough to get out of out of that grade. I mean, the hurling in it is good. You'll have to be really going well. But, but like Owler de Balak is staunch hurling and always has been since the 60s. So, I mean, the lads will do, and the management will do every possible thing that they can to get back up senior straight mm-hmm. away. Like, you know, but but it'll still be a few years before this this good crop that's coming through will be there. Like, it'll still be five or six years for, for they'll be old enough to play. Like, mm. And so you mentioned that you're involved with Tamon there. I remember several years ago, I'm sure I said this to you before, that Wakula went, went down and played a challenge match against you, maybe 2011, 2012, something like that. And afterwards, you were giving us a talk after the game and, you know, saying, you know, a lot of talk about stick passing, crossfield stick passing, you know, lots of the stuff that I'm sure you're still into and your passion was very obvious. So the, in a roundabout way, what I'm coming to is, is the passion still as strong as it ever was for hurling and for coaching? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's different. It's gone. It, it's gone... It's gone different in the sense of now it's about possession and possession based and keeping it and the running game and 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 not turning over and winning the rooks. Like I mean, that's totally new to hurling in the last five or six years. Like you know what I mean? One time, if you had more than four people in a group, you got the absolute asshole let off you from the sideline by <laughs> by being in a group or a crowd. Like so, keep the space. And now it's the opposite. Like get as many into the rook as you can and make sure you win it, and then come out and keep the ball. So it's a it is it it is it it's it's a different base game like i mean to for my whole career it was win your own ball it was 50 50 play it down like and win the battles everybody win their own battle now it's about keeping the ball to get it into the shooters in the right position and make sure you get the right people on it to shoot like not not the fellas that are not accurate so it's a you know it's 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 more i suppose soccer based possession wise now mm. and would would but the older, I mean, I think the the more you go back down in the grades, the more old style it is in the sense that it's 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 get out of the danger area. You know what I mean? If if it's in your full back lines, the possibility of a goal was up in their full back line, well you have a possibility of a goal or a pint. Mm. Are, are so you whereas still... at senior level now it's make sure that you get it and run it through the lines and your your I mean your corner back now has to be nearly your most accurate player because he's the one that's coming on the overlap, like you know. And do you do you enjoy watching hurling as much as you used to? Do you like the direction it's moving in? I do, but I miss the matchups. I miss the matchup. Like who's going to hold Shefflin? Who's going to hold DJ? Who's going to hold Fast Eddie? Who's going to hold Joe Canning? Who's going to hold them? Now you put a man in front of him, you put a man and you cut the supply off. It's a different it's a it's it's actually different to what it was in our time that if you were centre forward or wing forward, you are going to be under at least seven or eight pookouts. And your mm-hmm. job was to win them or the majority of them. Whereas that's not now. Your wing forward now needs to be in your wing back line. Coming forward, coming back to help to defend and carrying and stuff like, you know, whereas, whereas in our time it was win the ball, take them on and score a pint or set up a goal. It's just a different, you know, it, the whole game has changed in that sense. So you have to, you have to, you have to now literally one time if you go, your cornerback didn't have to be a good hurler. He had just had to be a good stopper. Mm. Now he has to be the most skillful, fittest player on the field. Whereas going back twenty years ago, he didn't have to be. So the whole, the whole aspect of the of the game has completely changed in that sense. Like you know, 
Yeah, so I, if I'm to bring this conversation then on to the Leinster club final that we saw yesterday at Croke Park, I was in there and, you know, after a, a good opening quarter where Clock Balakala acquitted themselves pretty well, it was 1-4 to 6 points at that stage and Owen Cody had scored the goal. They finished up 6-23 to 14 points and just it was it was a tough one to watch for a finish, wasn't it? It was a case of, you know, that, that whole Simpsons kind of joke, like he's dead already, stop killing. Like it was a really tough watch for a finish, wasn't it? But Valley Hale, very impressive. But it just showed you the level of skill in Bally Hale when they want to be. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you watch the first 15 minutes and you're thinking, Jesus, Clockwell is going to they're bring this. They're, they were bringing three lads to every battle. They were, they were all over. Like, I mean, I was watching and I was just, uh, it was my father's anniversary yesterday and a few of the family were down when we were looking at the at the first half of it here. And uh, like, I was saying, Jesus, they're bringing some amount of physicality. But they won't be able to keep that up that they left three lads tackled in every every Shamrock player that got a ball. I mean, and that lasted for about 15 minutes. But then, like, then, like, it was just the cuteness of the passing. Like, you take TJ's pass just barely over the full-backs out of Amar's head to, to, to Colin Fenley. Like, I mean, it was precision. The ball went, he jumped and he put the hurl up and it still went that six inches over the top of the hurl straight into Fenley. Hmm. And you take, you take Fenley's flick with one hand. Like, I mean, you can't coach that. That's an inherited skill that you get from the time you're seven or eight years of age, picking the ball, hitting the ball off the wall. I mean, it was three lads tackling the foot, the goalkeeper was coming out to meet him, and he just flicked it over his head into the net. Like, you I mean that's not coachable? That's that's an inner instinct that you have. It's a skill. It's just it's just the way that he's made. Like TJ has it, and you know, like real great players, all of them have that. You look at Brian Wheeler and they playing. And to be three lads around him, and he still was able to create that bit of room to strike the ball. And he never looked like there was a speed merchant. He never looked at him, but he just had that ability to to make space. And you know, as the, as the game was going on, I was thinking to myself, is this the best ever Bally Hale side? Because they've for the first time ever they've won a Leinster three in a row. They're looking like they might win three in a row all Ireland. They're certainly going to be heavy favourites to do it. And I threw up a poll, and it was it was fairly split. Like in general, people I think there was more votes saying it is their best ever. But this isn't the side with Shefflin, and you could argue that TJ Reid's 34, so he, he might he's obviously not the player he was when he was 27, 28 or whatever. Where do you think they lie? I mean, Eddie Brennan replied to me saying maybe the team around 2007 and 8 might be their best ever side, but do you reckon this might be their best ever? I think I think if they win the All Ireland this year, yes, definitely. I mean, they will they will they will approve that. Like, I mean, yeah. to do three in a row back to back. But I tell you what, they have that maybe other teams don't have. There seems to be a conveyor belt of young lads coming through, doesn't there, that are just absolutely as good as what's going down. Like, you know, I mean, you can't replace Henry Shefflin easy. But, like, when you're bringing in lads and they're scoring goals and they're on the and they're on the move and they're creating all the time, like, you know what I mean? They seem, there doesn't seem to be a weak link in the Ballyhale team. I mean, Joey, I was looking at Joey yesterday in the first half. He got a ball. And he, he looked like he was going to hit it 100 yards and he was in the middle of the wind-up and he threw it up and then he just flicked it 15 yards to his left. It was played into the wing and the ball was over the bar. But like everybody was expecting this ball to land in around, land in around Fenley on the 21 and he decided, no, this crowded up in there in the middle of his swing and he just flicked it to his left. Ball went to the right wing and the ball went over the bar. Like, like lads would say, you no, know, you're caught, but you can't coach that inner side. You can't coach that that peripheral vision or anything like that. Like you either have peripheral vision in your play and you often hear lads saying, no, oh, that lad is tunnel vision or peripheral vision. Like an awful lot of the Kilkenny lads have that peripheral vision, whether it's a, an innate thing that they have out there or not. But, you know, it's 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 being able to see the best place to play the ball. And they do that, like Ballyhale do that quite often compared to other teams. Yeah, play like the right mean, ball at the right time. Like What other club team has Colin Fenley and TJ Reid playing inside? And then... Players who are able to deliver lovely crossfield ball, whether it's straight onto the hand or, you know, up for a 50-50 high ball, which they're great at, or into space. I mean, I felt very sorry for the full back line of Clock Balakala. There wasn't much they could do. I also felt sorry for the likes of Picky Maher inside because, you know, there might be a ball that he's trying to win, but, like, the defender only needs to try and spoil him. He doesn't need to win it, just so the likes of maybe Joey Holland can mop up. So I'm not really sure there's anything that Clock could have done to to win the game, but I do think push, pushing for goals early and then getting hit in the counter the other end meant they turned what was going to be, you know, a heavy enough loss into a bit of an annihilation, just pressing for goals too early. Yeah, but I would I would say I I, I would say that Bally Hale, after being counting themselves lucky maybe last week to get into extra time, 
they weren't going to take any chances yesterday. And they looked like they weren't going to take any chances yet. They looked absolutely ruthless. And I mean, as you were saying, when it went in at half time, there were was a double scores at half time, I think, going in. Give or take, and yeah. They took no foot off the pedal. They absolutely put in the knife and twisted it. Like, you know what I mean? They were they weren't holding up or they weren't pulling back air a bit. They were like, I mean, six goals. You know, there's there's nothing. I mean, you were mentioning Colin Fenley there. I just think Colin Fenley is hurling way better this year after not hurling with Kilkenny, whether he's fresher or whatever. But he seemed to me like that he had a and he had a smile on his face. Like mm. he just seemed to me yesterday that he was gunning for the ball, like you know. Whereas maybe maybe he's fresher after having a sort of a long career and you know it's, it's there's always a they're always in a semi final or an all Ireland semi final, so it's a long old career to get back to your club and have that same hunger and passion and drive. And he looked yesterday to be absolutely like on top of the ground flying, like you know. And how good do you think Owen Cody uh, can become? Like he scored, I think two three. I have him from play here. Took over the freeze when TJ went off and knocked him over like not a bother at all. Like, how good do you think he can get? But sure, is he is he going to be fast, Daddy or Henry or DJ again? Like, I mean, but you have so many to compare it to over the years. Like, you'd Liam Fenley, you go through it, you'd be Christy Everett. Like, can, can he turn over hurlers quicker probably than any team in Ireland? Because they don't play very, very little football. So it's they're, they're at a premium and at a bonus there to that point that if someone is a good young sportsman, and you can turn them totally to hurling, well, then you're getting a real good good one. Like, you know what I mean? And I think, like, if you look at him, he has no... I don't think he's any idea how good he is himself, which is great that he doesn't He doesn't think I'm a, I'm a, I'm this, this massive hurler. Like, he just goes out to get the ball to do his job, and he seems to be a real ordinary fellow away from it, like, which... Which you need to be like, because not you get caught up in the in the the reviews of the likes of you and me, and then you're one of God and nothing, and then that affects you. Whereas he doesn't do that, you know. It's not. Yeah. It, it just seems like I seen one of his interviews, and he's just he just seemed to be so natural about it, like you know. Yeah, like to to me, he could like he's obviously one young hurler of the year twice in a row now, but I could see him being a future hurler of the year. Yeah, absolutely. But you won't be the future hurler of the year unless Kilkenny is winning all Ireland. So don't ever mm. forget that because it's very seldom goes outside the winning, the winning, the winning team. Like I mean, if if you tell me that twelve of the best hurlers in Ireland are in Limerick at the moment, I won't agree with you. You won't. No. So what what do you think it is then with them? It's just that the team that wins always gets the most accolades. Like I mean, that's that's life. That is the way I teach. You have to be, you have to be with the best teams to get to get the top accolades. Like you have to be in all Ireland semi-finals and finals. Like show me that's that's just the way it is. That's that's media attention. That's that's sport. It's in, that's across the world like. Do, do you, you know think I mean? uh, but, Cork were hard done by getting no all stars? Well, like would you agree with it? I'm I'm turning into the interview here. Would you think that they should, after getting to an all Ireland final that they should have got no all stars? I think they should have got probably two all stars. Well, now that's my well then there's my 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 question answered already that I said I'm not taking from Limerick, they're, they're, they are what Kilkenny were going back, we say, for five or six years. They're untouchable because their bench is as good as the players on the field. And when you have that, when you have that privilege and that, you're in a great position, right? And they are the best team. I'm not taking from But I still think 12 All-Stars out of 15. I don't know if that is, if that is fair. On, 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 if, you're picking, if you're picking the actual best 15 hurlers in the country. Yeah. No, I don't I'm know with if you. I have 12 of them now. I'm with you on that one. Do you know, actually, just to jump back to, to club, what do you make now? Like, I would have looked at Clock Balakala and thought Croke Park has kind of worked against them here. And I think a lot of people would have suggested that maybe it would. Ballyhale are so comfortable there. But um, for the All-Ireland semi-finals, you know, whoever comes through, like it's going to be uh, St. Thomas's of Galway against Ballyhale and then Schlock Neal are going to be against the winners of Ballygunner and Kilmallock in the Munster final. I would have thought, no matter what way it works out, that they should play both semi-finals at Croke Park, whether it's the same day or a double header or, or uh, separate days. I don't really mind, but for whoever plays Bally Hale in the All Ireland final, I think realistically they probably need a run out in, in Croke Park to get used to it. Because as I found, there's nothing quite like playing at Croke Park. It's very different uh, to, to playing in any other provincial ground. Absolutely, it, because the, the whole aura of going to Croke or without even the pitch or the dressing rooms or the facilities or anything, the aura of going to Crow Park is big in itself in the sense, oh, geez, we're going to the home of Hurling, we're going to the most important place. And that adds a little bit of pressure without ever going into the dressing room to talk out 
And when you do hit it, like you're so used to being in, we say, rural type dressing rooms and facilities that all of a sudden you walk into the set up in Crow Park. And it nearly changes your preparation because of how good everything is up there. Plus the pitch, plus the officials, plus all the cameras, plus all the media attention. It is it is just a different type thing, you know what I mean? And and it's probably nothing to do with the hurling, but it does add to the pressure of the whole situation. Like it makes it a bigger event than it actually is at times. Like, you know, like yeah. you often hear the old saying years ago, like Crow Park will either make you or break you. Mm, no, it's true. And uh, like, so can I ask you then, what do you think the sort of order is in terms of like who are your favourites to win the All-Ireland? I'm sure Bally Hale are number one. But after that, Thomases are going to have to go through Bally Hale if they're going to win an All-Ireland. Like I look at Bally Gunner and I, you know, a team that's obviously trying to make that breakthrough. And I mean the All-Ireland breakthrough because the club has previously won Munster. But I, I look at them sometimes and I think actually of Owlers and not just because similar colours or what have you, but it, just a team desperate to make that breakthrough. And obviously Owler did in 2015. But do you look at Bally Gunner and see any similarities with yourselves back then? Loads of quality and just trying to make that breakthrough. Yeah, we never got across the we never got across the line. It took us years and years and years. And I mean, we played Burr when we won the first one in '94, and we bought into a replay. And um, Glen Moore beat us in the Leinster final in '95, and we possibly could have won the two of them. And I mean, Glen Moore won all Ireland's and Leinster's, and 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 Burr went on to win three or four all Ireland's and five or six Leinster's, and we didn't only got one. And I suppose it it was then. It got harder and harder and harder and harder every year to, to get the breakthrough. I mean, we got to thank God and we got a, a Leinster title out of it. But I think Bally Gunner, I think Bally Gunner are after being there and done that. And I just think there's a realisation in them that they it's the All Ireland, like that that the things are set, the, the the goals are set on the All Ireland, like that that's their that's their goal. But I mean, sure, Kilmallock is not going to lie down and say, oh, God, there, poor old, poor old Bally Gunner will let him have it. Like, that's not the way it works. Like, if, if you don't produce the highest level in an All Ireland semi final, you're paying one of the top four teams in the country. If you don't hurl at 98 or 95% of your best, well, you won't win because that's the way it is. Like, and I mean, as you said, the favourites has to be, has to be the Shamrock. Like, you know, Bally Hale have to be after yesterday's performance. But they're on a hiding to nothing too after winning by that much. Yes, everyone's putting them completely up on a pedestal. We're doing it there now, like you know. So they're there to be shot at. Yeah, you always hear that. It's, it's love pulling down the top, a top gun rather than a, an underdog, like you know. Mm. Oh, what did you make of that Bally Gunner uh, Lockmore game? And you know the red cards. And but to me, it just looked like a Bally. Like I was, I was, I felt a bit sore for Lockmore with the way the red cards happened and all that. But it looked to me like this Bally Gunner team, by hook or by crook, they don't care how, but they're going to win this game. So there was like an almost an edge of desperation to making sure they got over the line. Yeah, but I mean, the big thing was, would they have won if there hadn't been the two red cards? I mean, they have to, yeah, that's that's the big question. I don't know if they would have or not. I mean, Lockmore were just hanging in and hanging on and, and that's what they had done for their two or three previous games that they only come good in the last five to ten minutes that they, they only got in front and pushed on a bit. Like, you know, they seem to... They seem to play this game that we'll hang around, hang around, hang around, and then we put down the pedal near the end. Like, mm, and I mean, yeah. they didn't get the opportunity with the red cards. Now, I mean, I suppose, you know, they were soft enough red cards, really, weren't they? They were, I mean, there was never a good clatter for either of them, if you know what I mean. And, and, and it's quite hard, it's quite hard getting a red card when there's not a good clatter. You have to give them a fellow good belt, like, you know. Yeah, but you know, to, to my money, I think it's good that such focus has been put on the little bit of play acting there because we obviously don't want play acting to grow in the game. And I'd say Bally Gunner probably won't do it again because of all the focus. So, you know, you, you need to hammer that sort of stuff to make sure it doesn't creep into the game. Absolutely, but it is creeping in. It is yeah. the, the diving and stuff has started to creep in a little bit and the play acting as well. I mean, and it's just... I think it's, it's it's probably been nearly told because there's so much stats and so much stuff now and so much that have nothing to do with the actual game. Like, you know what I mean? That you, you, you're, you're trying to get every little edge and every little advantage. And I mean, we were told the opposite when we were playing. Like, if you get hit hard, you get up and you show nothing. You never show that you're injured. You never show that you're hurt. We can always get a bit of treatment, come out and pretend you're getting a drink of water and we'll take a look at you. But don't stay down. Like, we, you know the way? It's amazing how it's turned from from what it was that you never showed that you were weakness like you, know, you were told not to show weakness yeah. so no matter how hard you got hit pretend you didn't like, until there's a break on or there's someone and then you get a little bit of attention or you get a drink or get whatever like you know 
And can I ask you about uh, Wexford? So Davy Fitz obviously finished up his five years, won that Leinster title. Uh, Darry Egan taking over. I suppose there's there's an element of unknown with Wexford going into next year. Absolutely. And I mean, maybe that's a good thing, though. Maybe it's a good thing because, I mean, we had become very, very familiar with, with Davy. Like the game plan was the same for four or five years and nearly everybody knew the way we were going to set up and the way it was going to be. So when it was counteracted, then it was easier to counteract it again. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, to me, I think Daryl will bring a whole new, a whole new thing to it. He'll bring a whole new momentum and he'll bring, he'll, 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 he'll bring a change for the players, which is the big thing, I think, you know what I mean? It'll challenge the players again to maybe play a different way and we'll get more out of them again. Like, you know, we often get into a routine of playing the same way for four or five years and it becomes habitual, like, whereas, whereas now, with with this with the new setup, it'll all change again, and hopefully, I think that could be a good thing. I mean, the lads, they won two or three under twenty one Leinster titles, and they're only 26, 27 years of age now. So they're not like you know, what I mean, they're, they're coming into their prime. There's young good lads coming behind them. So I, I just don't think the one like it's only three years since they won a or two years since they won a, a Leinster final. So I I just think they're they're that far off the mark. Right? Maybe it's just that we had become predictable and maybe it was easy to counteract our game plan. Mm. And I remember you saying to me, oh, it must be a year and a half, maybe two years ago, that the players had run up backwards up uh, Mount Leinster for him. Do you think the kind of message after a while was lost a little bit? And I don't know that, that it was certainly time for, for David to move on at the end of it. And, you know, obviously great things in winning that Leinster title, but all good things come to an end. Yeah, well... <laughs> I just think we were like we were we were predictable. I mean, like everybody knew our game plan that we we're going to get loads and loads and loads behind the ball and then try and attack up the field. And like we were counteracted on it. We, we didn't pick up key players at times that were doing phenomenal scoring. Like I mean, Tony Kelly scored I think one nine one day against us. And he, like I mean, how a player was allowed to score one nine from middle of the field from play without being man marked is, you know, I would question that in my head anyway. Like, that's 12 points. It takes 13 points. I mean, what other player on the on your team is going to score 13 points? Mm. You know, you have to... You have to you have to sort of change and adapt in the game. And you look at last year's or this year's All-Ireland Final when Cork stuck rigidly to their game plan. Limerick annihilated it, like... Because there's only one game plan going to work on the day, Shane, and both of us have up game plans. And if yours doesn't get into the ascendancy in the first 15 minutes, and the other team does... Well, they're not going to change to let you into the game, or they're going to drive their game plan through you. So you have to have plan B and plan C, and I don't think we had plan B and plan C. Mm. And is there any concern that you know Darry Egan maybe hasn't managed? I mean, I'm, obviously he would have managed certain teams at different levels, and he's coached in different places, including Tipperary and some other clubs. But would you have any concern that he doesn't have experience of leading a team at this level? No, I don't know. I wouldn't know. He's been with Tipperary in the one in All Ireland. I mean. Do you know what I mean? He was sitting there and he was in there for every night, so he knows exactly what it takes. I mean, so you have to start somewhere, like you know what I mean? And and he his credentials are good and, and he's coming in and he's young and he's you know, he's going to bring a whole new momentum to it, I think. I because I think Wexford will be fresh this year and they'll be turned to go again, like you know. Mm. And Leinster is going to be very interesting with Henry Shefflin taking over at Galway. Obviously, Matty Kenny and his Dublin team and Kilkenny are still there interested and obviously we can't wait to see Henry Shefflin manage against Kilkenny really that there'd be a bit of fun to that but you see that's it like you know it's going to add spice to it isn't it it's going to make it a it's going to make it it's it's going to make it really really interesting I mean because I suppose Kilkenny has come back to the pack they were really ahead of the pack there for years Kilkenny has come back to the pack then Galway went a little bit ahead and there after coming back to the pack so you have like you have you have Galway, Kilkenny, Dublin, Wexford, you know what I mean? Awfully leash. I mean, on any given day, any one of them could nearly be any one of them. You know, yeah. it's it's a it's a sort of a it's it's gone from always being able to say Kilkenny is going to win Leinster. That has changed now in the last few years. Like, you know, I mean the big thing is who's going to stop Limerick again. Like, I mean, that's obviously the big you know, that's 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 the big, 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 big question, like, you know. And do you think anyone can? I mean, Tipperary, obviously, new manager as well, and probably looking to transition in some fresh players. So maybe that'll take a while. Can Cork come back from a final drubbing? I think that, like, I don't think that that's going to be like set them back a few years or anything like that. I think most players have been hammered in a game at some stage. It doesn't mean that you're consigned to defeat for the rest of your career. 
No, I, I, I don't think it's going to affect Cork at all. I actually think it will stand to them. I think after getting to it, like nobody expected Cork to get to the All Ireland final at the start of the year. So I think getting to it was the actual bonus. Now, mm. unfortunately, it was a heavy defeat in the final, a very heavy defeat. But, but I just think that Cork have to win a minor under twenty ones. There, the, the Cork's underage has been really, really exceptional for the last four or five years, and it does take it does take like three or four years senior before you settle in and find your feet and and get everything you know what i mean exactly right like you know i i, I just think cork will be a threat in the next three to four years definitely absolutely i mean i'd be hoping that you'd be hoping that that there'd be more threats as well you'd be hoping maybe galway will come back up the up the peck and order be hope kilkenny hope wexford like you'd be hoping that another few teams will come back up because as it is limerick does look to be to have the edge on everybody at the minute, like they look to have that edge. Mm. So you would be hoping that that had close or it's, it doesn't make for a good championship, like, you know? Yeah. Where do you think Keane Lynch rates in terms of like, it's getting to a stage where he's going to be mentioned in all time greats if he keeps this up? Absolutely. But his, his distribution and his reading and his knackiness and his, his little flicks and ticks and taps, like he's just an exceptional player. Like, you know what I mean? He has that, he just has that, that, that knackiness of knowing where everybody else is without looking that's the peripheral vision like you know mm. plus he seems to pleasant with a bit of a swagger and a bit of crack like in it you know and and i mean that's that's the i mean that's what makes it good i think you know he has that he has that just ability to read the game and get into the right positions and pass the ball into the right positions when you think when you think he's looking one way he passes it another way like you know mm. and um one question I wanted to ask you is about um, it's about Cork now, but Conor Lahan called back on the panel at the age. I think he's uh, he's turned twenty nine, or he will be for the championship next year. And I, I spoke with um, a Cork legend. I'm not going to name them because they de definitely didn't want me to quote them on this. But uh, this was before he was called back and said the only way I'd go back on the panel if I was Conor Lahan is if I was named captain. And you know, you know, for obvious reasons, you don't want to be worrying about your place. So he goes back in now and. You know, there's young, they're trying to bring through young players, but they saw what he did with Middleton. Do you, do you think it's a strange move to bring him back in? Or are you like, uh, because, you know, he'll probably still have to fight for his place. There's no guarantee he'll go back into the team. So if you're Conor Lahan, what, what, what do you think now going back in? Well, I'd say Conor Lahan is very confident going back in that he's going to make his place, or he probably wouldn't have gone. He just did not go back in, you know, at the request end of it. I'd say he analysed it and he said a bit and said, right, I'm hurling well, I'm going well. And um, we're after hurling real well, so I'm going through a good patch. There's a good future with Cork at the minute. I mean, I just said a few minutes ago that I didn't see Cork being written off after last year's All Ireland final. I'd say he's seen himself picking up a picking up a, a monster medal or an All Ireland. That's why he's going back in. And but like when you are playing, when you're playing, like you have that belief in yourself that that you're good enough. Like you know, you don't have any doubts. The old saying is, "Doubt your doubts, not your belief." So he believes in his heart. That he's good enough to be on the team, so I'd say that's exactly it. Like you know, I mean, that's a great how saying we got from Liam Griffin was, was doubt your doubts, not your beliefs. So mm -hmm. your beliefs. So I mean, that's that's a that's a it's just something that the player has. I'd say. Plus, he's Did only twenty nine get... years of age. Like he's not he's not thirty two or three. Like yeah, D come here. It's been twenty five years since he won your All Ireland. Did you have any meet up? Did you get a chance to celebrate it? No, we had a we had a two nights booked and we had to cancel it with the. With the COVID, so it's with, went out the wind on us. Ah, uh, do, do you get a chance? Ah, look, at it, it's not it, to be on. To be honest, it'd be very stupid of us and very, very selfish of us to go off and book a hotel, seventy or eight of us, and and, and get COVID and spread it around the place to just fulfil our own our egos after twenty five years. Like you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in that no, at all. Do, do you keep get in contact with... somewhere when we meet up? Hopefully, <laughs> do you, do you get uh, much chance to to relive the days? Would you keep in contact with an awful lot of team? Ah, oh, we do. Ah, oh, we do. And we train me up. We train me up for a few pints always before Christmas. But see, with the last couple of years with the COVID, you can't. Like you know, it's just not possible. We, we just go into and we just get a bit of grub and and we just a few pints and and slag the arse off each other again. Like after ten minutes of all the the lovely stuff, how are you? How's the family? How's everyone? It's straight back to exactly the way it was. Like the same lads get busted all the time. It's the same slagging and it's the same. You couldn't believe it. Like it's twenty five years. And everyone is so nice for the first 15 minutes. And how was the children? And how was this? And how was that? And how was work going? And then it had start. Who'd be the Who'd be the funny man? I mean, I, I always got the sense that Larry O'Gorman would be very good crack. Tom Dempsey would absolutely wipe you. 
with with comments. Thomas, 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 you fred up your mouth to Tom because he'll always have an answer for you. Larry, oh, it'd be it'd be up there. Shawnee Flood is absolutely brilliant. Now Shawnee Flood, Larry Murphy gets all the slag, and most of it does be stuck at Larry. You know, I'm afraid <laughs> of, I'm afraid of me mouth because it just caused me the captain shut up like so. I'm afraid to say much. <laughs> well, look, Martin, it's been brilliant having you on, and really appreciate you you giving us so much time today. So thanks very much for that, and hopefully we'll be chatting again soon. Please, thanks. Be good yeah. now. Have a good Christmas. You too. Enjoy the Christmas. All the best. All the best. Well, be good. So that was uh, Martin's story there. Always brilliant to have him on. Just a reminder, brought to you by uh, orgaretro.com. If you want to get maybe this Wexford jersey, any of the ones on screen, there's a whole catalogue at orgaretro.com, and you can use the promo code RGAME, and you'll get 15% off. Also, if you want to get the audio podcast, make sure you just go to um, patreon.com forward slash RGAME. Great way to support the channel. And please do subscribe to the channel. Press that button in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, we have Finton O'Toole of the 42 on the line now as well. Uh, Finton, how's things with you? Hi, right, Shane. What's the form? Uh, not too bad. You had a busy old weekend, but you were down at, um, I think, Parky Rin for St. Finbar's and uh, an Air Oak, which we'll come to in a little while. But uh, just uh, I'm just going to finish off the hurling there. That, uh, Schlock Neil, they're obviously Ulster champions after beating Valley Cran of down 114 to 10 points. Interesting. I, I know you didn't get a chance to see the game now, but... Um, Cormac O'Doherty said afterwards, go on now and do something special. You know, he's the captain. So Schlock Neil have gotten through three times before and obviously haven't had a win in the All-Ireland Series just yet. So it sounds like, you know, they've had enough of just winning Ulster titles and they want to go on and actually make an impact thereafter. Yeah, I think this is the, I think it's four, four out of five now, four out of the five last Ulsters they've won in Harlem. They've obviously won, was it three football? They would have been in two finals and I think they lost a semi as well. Uh, one of the years senior Rangers so like, that's a lot of when you're operating off the same squad that's a lot of all-earning club campaigns packed into it with unfortunately no silverware to show for it you know um, and I suppose from the outside you would have been seeing before the football was the main game and the main chance of winning but I think with how far they pushed Paddy Hale you know it's only last year now but obviously feels like so long ago but it was only uh, January 2020 you know how far they pushed on that day I think in their eyes um you know, they'll feel that now is the chance to have a crack off it. And even, and even before that, like, it was a 2018 that they gave an appearance like enough with in Parnell Park, you know. Um, they weren't too far off them that day, you know. So it just sounds like probably a side that aren't are kind of fed up with just winning Ulsters now, you know. Um, yeah. And just kind of a job to be done. Um, you know, maybe the shortened gap will kind of help them. You know, it's not going to be too long to wait now, at least compared to usual. You know, usually the Ulster, uh, as you know, from memory, the Ulster hurling final usually is one of the first kind of done. You know, it was kind of done around October and they would have a long gap through February. At least now you're only waiting until the 22nd of January, and obviously they'll get to look at the uh, the monster final as well to see who they'll be facing, you know? Yeah, and it was a bit of redemption for 2018 when I think Ballycran beat them. Uh, Brendan Rogers, who's been unbelievable for them this year, was really good against Don Loy the week before, and I think marked Keelan Malloy out of it. Uh, Cormac Doherty scored 7.6 of them frees. Now, they definitely weren't as good as they were against Don Loy, but sure, they won't really care. Just to, even though it's it's a bit away yet, the, the 23rd of January, I think it's now actually been fixed for that game against Ballygunner and Kilmallock, uh, or against the winners of that. What, what were you looking at the the, the Ballygunner against Kilmallock game at this stage? I know it's a few weeks out, but are you sort of leaning towards the side of, of Ballygunner and Kilmallock? Uh so one of the interesting things I think is the venue for this, like the fact that it's been fixed for Porky Cueve, um, you know, like it's probably the second best pitch surface at the moment in terms of the country, um, you know, and like if you if you look at the way the Crow Park at the weekend, obviously you would have seen Bally Hale, you know, how kind of fast they move there. I think that's going to facilitate Bally Gunner. Um, you obviously know the, the conditions in Porky are in for the, the last time they were in the final uh, down in Cork. Oh, you know, it's going to be a world away from that, you'd imagine, you know. So imagine that's going to help them a bit. It was quite difficult. It was down in the far field last week. Um, for their kind of short passing game, their kind of style, you know. But um, definitely, I think there's a sense that from a couple of weeks back, because they were so impressive, I suppose, when they won Waterford and they were so impressive when they beat Ballier that they were, you know, notionally were they streets ahead of everyone else in Munster, you know. I, you know, I wouldn't have thought that at the time. I thought whoever was going to come through, Kilmallock Middleton, was going to be in a good shape. And I particularly think the way Kilmallock came through and like they've Paddy O'Loughlin back and they just have a lot of experience. Like this isn't the case that this is going over all of them, you know, there's still a lot of the team. That were in the 2015 All Ireland Club final there, and then you've added to that Washington O'Reilly, Michal Hoolahan, you know, who are kind of lighting it up, you know. So uh, to me, it's it's a bit more of a 50 50 game than maybe I would have thought of from the outside of Munster. You know, it's, it's very hard when you're assessing form, but you probably would have put Bally Gunner, and I think they were kind of strong favourites to be Munster, but uh, there's definitely a sense that it's maybe kind of levelled a bit now. Um, but like from Bally Gunner's point of view, to win the way they did last week, obviously 
probably not going to go back over old ground. You know, there was a good few controversial incidents for it, like, but to just it's a survival is the name of the game at the moment, you know, just coming through these kind of battles, you know. Um, and I just think when I just heard that about the when the venue was in last week with Porky Cui, you know, to me, I think that's a bit of a boost uh, for their chances in terms of the, the kind of style that they play. And, you know, you can imagine the kind of fast diagonal balls that they're going to try to feed into Desi Hutchinson, for example. So the, the topic then of Croke Park for All-Ireland semi-finals, because, you know, so often a team goes into an All-Ireland final, probably their first time ever playing there. And if you come up against Bally Hale, who's, you know, all of their players are so used to Croke Park at this stage. It can be a massive disadvantage. Would you like to see all Ireland semi finals played at Crow Park, even though they'd be more or less, you know, feel, it would probably feel like the place is empty? Uh, yeah, to be honest, the, 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 the size of the crowd is never really an issue for me in terms of having games there. You know, it can still be quite a cool atmosphere when you're at matches and it's just the lower Hogan there. And I suppose we're, we're sitting in the upper Hogan in the press box, but there is that kind of well of noise, you know, and even like watching the Leinster Club football semis on Saturday, it looked like an unbelievable occasion, you know, when the camera would pan. To the lower Hogan at various stages during the two games, and just what a great kind of thrill it seemed, you know. For okay, Kilmaco players may be a bit used to it from playing with Dublin and all that, but for the whole of the Shelman Ears club to be heading up to Crow Park on the Saturday before Christmas, um, simply for Port Harrington seemed a kind of big, kind of novel occasion, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean like you know, otherwise, where's it going to be on? I mean, like Shot Neil, are you looking at kind of Parnell Park? I mean, if you're going to be taking it to there, um, and like I think the Leinster Club football final is going to be on in Crow Park as well, so. Mm. The precedent has been set. Um, you know, we don't know yet, I suppose, uh, what way the parents obviously are finalised. Obviously, we know it's uh, Ballyhale, St. Thomas, but I mean, I'm presuming Central Stadium is the, the front runner for that if they're not going to go uh, to Crow Park. So, yeah, definitely, I think I think it's possibly a bit more of a realistic prospect now with the fact that we've seen it being used in the Leinster Club Championship and we've seen the success of it. And, you know, it is it is topical. Like, you know, it was a valid point to talk Frankie McGrath made last week when he was talking about kind of the far field and, you know, it's no fault of the groundsman of the far field, like, but it just cut up very badly towards the end. Um, I can understand why it was on there, though, because it had floodlights, and that was probably a pre. I think that had to take precedent, especially with the finish on the day. Um, when Watch Park just doesn't have that kind of facility available to it, you know. So, and I wondered once the council did, were they cognizant of that? The fact that they fixed the the club final out for Porky Queeve when. Uh, you know, I suppose traditionally, Bally Gunner, Kilmallock, you'd think Walford and Champions, that would be in Thurles, you know, generally the most club hurling finals in Thurles. So, yeah, be interested to see, you know, will they do something similar for the, the hurling and the football? Yeah, and it is interesting for the football, like, whether it's Crokes getting through or Nace getting through, like, that'll be a very good Leinster final. Both of those teams will have played two games at Croke Park, and they might end up in an all Ireland final against, you know, for example, if Derry Gonnelly get there, having never played at Croke Park before, these teams will have played two games there this season, so it's a little bit imbalanced that way. But speaking of that, uh, those Leinster football semi-finals, I mean, there had been talk of two handy wins here for Nace and Kilmacud against um, against Shelmaliers of Wexford and uh, Port Arlington of Leash. But both games ended up being really, really good. Even just to start off with the Nace game, it was two fifteen to one thirteen after extra time. So first ever Leinster final for them. The hurlers are also in the intermediate. Um, intermediate Leinster final also. Like, it was a brilliant comeback. Uh, the only thing, though, the, that Derek Irwin goal that uh, brought them back, I kind of feel like maybe that should have been called back for steps. Yeah, I did. I mean, I was only looking back and it was there an element of a frontal charge on Brian Malone. Um, I don't know if you remember, it's like when he just the last kind of, the second last challenge, you know. Um, yeah, it, it kind of happened so fast and it was, it was like, it felt like they were going to need that kind of a rapid move involving either him or Amy Callahan to kind of unlock the Shelmere's defence because at halftime, I thought they could have appointed them in the second half, but then as you got to the third quarter and there's still that three-point gap, it kind of felt they were going to need a goal to really kind of um, kick things into gear. Um, but it was brilliant from Kerwin, you know, exactly what you want in terms of your county player, in terms of the star man, you know, just to bring up that piece of inspiration, that piece of magic that they really, really needed to kind of to kind of get them going. Now, even at that, obviously, it took a last gasp injury time free to kind of get them out of jail. So it wasn't just the goal that uh, that kind of saved them, you know. But um, yeah, in terms of the like, two very interesting games, I thought similar enough teams in terms of underdogs starting well, and then maybe just a bit of energy. Uh, you know, kind of went out of their challenge and the other team got on top. Probably a bit more pronounced in the Kilmacud case um, than the first game. Um, I'm sure we'll come to it like, but I think the first game it just highlighted there's just a serious, serious inconsistency with the black card and red card in terms of carrying over to extra time. Well, I, don't really mind, I don't really mind which way they go. 
but I just think that both of them, so either both of them carry over or neither of them carry over because it definitely is issue. And the first Sean Lear is actually, I think they only conceded a point, was it? Uh, and then Malone came back on and then I think they conceded two. Uh, so they actually did quite well, I thought, to start of extra time in terms of playing down the clock and kind of retaining the ball. But obviously it just seemed getting into the last 10 minutes, uh, the second period of extra time, I just thought that they were, their energy was gone and they just didn't get that bounce off the bench that, uh, that Nace were getting, you know? And I did think Shelmaliers looked really good and they looked, you know, like a team board for the stage and Glenn Malone running things and thought Connor yeah. Hearn, like another county hurling panellist, they thought he was brilliant up there in corner forward. But like Eamon Callahan, 39 years of age, those two frees, like you mentioned him hitting the equaliser at the end, but he'd hit an equaliser a couple of minutes before that as well. So he's got serious cojones on him to be doing that and even to still be sprinting around the pitch during extra time for a guy at 39, I think it's incredible. Yeah, it's it's absolutely phenomenal what he's done. Um, and I mean, free taking. I suppose he was in a Kildare team where we, you know, Johnny Doyle was the free taker. I, I can never really recall him taking frees or that being kind of his role. You know, he was kind of more just the hard work moving forward, chipped in with a couple of points. But lovely kicking style off the hand, um, and obviously the the cameras under pressure to kind of nail scores in that kind of situation. Um, but obviously, just his overall contribution to the club in terms of the. The kind of helping out with the management side of things that he's been involved in um this year has obviously been a big thing and i'd say there's a sense of a guy who waited so long for a county title uh they got a stroke of luck you know you would have seen the in the quarterfinal against the uh, tullamore with the way they or sorry the first game against tullamore the way they won that but i would imagine just speculating that he's the kind of guy you know in that dressing room is kind of saying to a lot of these younger lads after they won the county final look you know, we might get this chance again. And uh, in fairness to them, they really push on, which is impressive because sometimes, you know, you see that doesn't happen with a team that hasn't won a county in so long. Um, and he's, you know, absolutely integral to it, like, you know. Do, do, you, do you get any sense that Nace are a team that there was so much expectation of them, even though this is their first time at this stage? By the way, the other thing about him, Callan, he made his senior debut for the club in 1998 and he's still going. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. But, do you think in some ways like there was extra pressure on Nace because people expected them to win and to have some of these star players? And then also another question about Derek Kerwin. You know, like we had Davy Burke, former under-21 uh, Kildare manager on the show the other day, and he was talking about that he can be as good as anyone in the country. Like To me, there's a cut of David Clifford about him in the sense of the size and the ability to move and strike him. I'm not saying he's in the same level, but like they've got that class. And also maybe now Nace, having got that win at Croke Park, maybe they can kick on and show their true selves from here. Yeah, well, I suppose first of all, in terms of them being favourites, I think there's an element of they're a massive club. They're from a massive mm. catchment area. You know, the view would have been for all their population and resources, to use that phrase, that they've underachieved a bit and not managing to win a county senior title. I mean, it's 21,000, I think, in the town. Um, and they've obviously only won a one-club town. Like, you know, I like that. That would be similar for, you know, I'd see it in big clubs in Cork and, you know, big kind of city teams that come out, they would be expected to be favourites. But, it is still completely new for them, you know. It is a completely new stage. Um, I mean, Kerwin and Callaghan aside, and obviously Owen Doyle, you know, for a lot of the rest of them, that's a big new stage. Okay, I guess some of them may be involved in Kildare in the 20s and things like that, but they still have to go through the same kind of pressures and challenges that any club team that is kind of new uh, to kind of Manchester City final. Um, and it is kind of interesting in kind of how to handle that pressure, whereas several years are probably coming in with kind of nothing to lose. You know, it would be viewed, I think they were three to one. Uh, to win the game, you know, um, and they would have been a challenge that I think you'd have had to re majorly respect beforehand on the basis that they've won county senior early and football titles. So they're very, very kind of seasoned. They're very well, well conditioned and um, very kind of physical. And obviously they got the early start um, with the goal. Um, so I think it was impressive by Nace the way they managed to reel them in um, and obviously kind of, I suppose, kind of hold their nerve and kind of extra time to get, kind of get the job done. But yeah, Corwin, he does stand out as that kind of match winner. And I think any... You look across the games over the weekend, I think most most teams had a kind of an inside forward that just has that bit of magic. And I think you just need that. If, if you have that player, it will just separate you from your opponents in this sort of stage. But he is that kind of big, kind of rangy, um, you know, the flashes that the Leicester final this year, even against Dublin, um, able to kick off both feet. I mean, like leave aside the goal for a minute, like he did kick a couple of really, really lovely points when he got that space. Uh, in the second half, and obviously Sean Maliers were alive to that challenge because he didn't get it as regularly um, as he would have liked, or perhaps uh, you know Nace would have thought. Like you know, so th that's a kind of a nice mix to have, like someone like Callahan who's so experienced and still so effective in your half forward line, and then have uh, Corbin inside. But um, 
could be wrong. I think Alex Byrne was kind of a big uh, loss for them in terms of, mm. you know, like if you get him back for the Leicester final now, you know, that's going to be a big one in terms of uh, having a kind of a twin pronged approach um, close to the goal and some of the kind of playoff curve in that way. Yeah, and Dermot Hannafin then with a brilliant goal on, on the 80 minute to finish the thing off. Kilmacud Croak took a long time to get going against Port Arlington, and just like Nace, they had to come back. They were, I think, 8 3 behind, and they won the remainder of the game, then 1 8 to 4 points. Keen O'Connor came off the bench to hit the goal, as he did against, uh, well, he scored a brilliant goal against St. Jude's in the Dublin final. Paul Mannion with three points. I got the, I, I heard talk that Port Arlington had a lot of COVID cases a, a little while back. But in the meantime, they beat um, St. Lomans, so I'm not sure how much that would have played into their performance on Saturday. But it was notable that so many Port Arlington lads did go down with cramp, and even early in the second half. Yeah, so their manager has spoken about this after the game. Um, that I think he said a lot of the cases came out of isolation on the Tuesday before the Lomans game. And they actually were okay in that game in terms of they started it well and they finished it well. And he said he wasn't making an excuse, but it was just notable. He said the four players that went down with cramp all had had COVID cases. He said they have a number of teachers, which there's no getting around that at the moment. You know, you can't as a manager, club manager tell your, you know, tell your parents or teachers not to work. Like, you know, and that's obviously a big issue at the moment with the situation in schools across the country. Um, so it was noticeable that way. I just thought this was an example of a game where the bench kind of told in terms of the energy the Kilmacud were able to kind of bring into it. I mean, O'Connor... I'm not sure the background of the situation, but I mean, I remember 2018 when they won the Dublin County title, he was absolutely superb as a wing back. And I think he got called in the following year to play O'Burn Cup uh, for Dublin. I'm not sh- maybe he might have made a, the odd league appearance. I'm not totally sure. But, you know, he's an absolutely brilliant footballer and showed it. Like Shane Horne's coming off the bench, mm. uh, an awfully senior. Even like the, when Port Arden were chasing the goal at the very end and it came to Horne, like just the, 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 I suppose the composure and the experience, the literally be able to carry the ball 50 yards down the left flank and uh, kind of relieve the pressure and then Connor Casey as well came on midfield and I thought he made a kind of a big impact but they were like like the white count was unbelievable like I mean like the commentary uh like Jerry Canning and Kieran Whelan were kind of dumbfounded until about the third quarter mark that it kept going but I felt like there was a few pot shots being taken in the first half whereas in the second half I think it was just inaccuracy but then they, they did manage to kind of get it together um you know, Shane Cunningham got three points. Obviously, Mannion got three points. Like Callum Pearson and Darren Mullen, you know, it started to kind of piece together for them. But the big thing ultimately, I think, was the squeeze they put on the Port Harrington kickout. Um, I don't know the stats, like, but the amount of short kickouts that Port Harrington got away, literally, the keeper playing it to go on the edge of the D in the first half. But they couldn't do that in the second half. They were just pushed up completely, kill the cut. And he was having to go along every time. And uh, he kind of had a bit of joy. I think it was uh, Sean Byrne was quite good at top of them, Port Arlington midfield. But he was one of the guys that kind of went down with cramp. His influence waned a bit. Like Casey came into the middle of the field and kill the cut just took over that middle third. And uh, you kind of felt the longer the thing went on, Port Arlington were going to need a goal to kind of rescue it. So in fairness, they, they made a serious goal that like to keep, I suppose, Benefiting from the amount of uh, misses that Kilmacud were putting on the board, you know. But, um, I mean, I'm sure from Kilmacud's point of view, I know that the squad has changed, but from the outside, the big thing is the one left the game of 2018 in terms of kind of writing that wrong for them in a game they were widely expected to win. And this would have been a similar situation. Um, so, from that point of view, it was impressive, I suppose, the way they, they kind of turned it around after a fairly miserable first half and nearly one half an hour without scoring. Yeah, because I was keeping track of the wides and what the lads were saying on TV as it was going on. And at at the 43 minute mark, it was 16 wides. Do you ever get a sense when you're watching a game that a few wides have been hit and there's a bit of a wide fever spreading through the team and it's almost the nerves are going into whoever the next shooter is because they're like, well, we have to get this next one. That seemed to play a factor. But I was very impressed with Croaks playing keep ball. And as Port Harrington were sort of physically fading, they just punished them so much by moving the ball around and like they're just like there was a bit a hint of experience, even though there's been big changeover in this team in terms of the playing personnel. To me, that just showed good experience out on the field, and that's going to stand to them now. And they're getting more and more games at Croke Park, obviously now with the Leinster Club final being there. Yeah, that, that's true. I thought one aspect of it was that the energy did fade out of the Port Arlington defensive effort. Mm. I mean, it was so good in the first half. They were so well organized in terms of they would allow you to have the ball about sixty yards out, but once it came into forty yards out. I mean, there was one effort. I think it looked like Crokes might have had a half chance of a goal before half time. Remember, Killian O'Shea got the ball. And it looked like for a brief moment that he was in on a goal on his own. But next thing out of nowhere, like four Port Harrington players are back. And 
forget about the Russian shot and it kind of went way off his uh, left foot. Just in the second half, they were just able to stretch it that bit more and it ended up, it was like, you know, where it might have been Mannion or Shane Cunningham uh, 1v2 or 1v3 in the first half. It was a bit more 1v1 um, in the second half. And look, I saw, I think it was the Don't Foul uh, Twitter account um, made the point, like, you know, it's just very hard to, to pin down someone like Mannion for 65 plus minutes, you know. And that's that's the that's the difference. I mean, Port Arlington only lost by two points, but, I mean, Mannion, like, some of the points he kicks, what do you do if you defender? Like, you know, you think you've pushed him as wide as you can. He just takes one half step inside and uh, his ability to knock it over. Um, like, we see him obviously do it countless times, but it's just that bit of kind of attacking magic and genius. And then, in fairness, like, Cunningham, I think, has played double in the 20. You know, Callum Pearson has... Um, yeah. Like I'd have to check the shots start, uh, ratio for the for the second half. I mean, there was a couple of goal chances as well. Like it was like it was relentless the the kind of pressure they were putting on. In fairness, Port Arlington, like when they did get forward, they got a couple of brilliant points. Um, in the second half, Jordan Foster got one, and the substitute Stephen O'Neill kicked a really really good. Or sorry, Jake Foster got one, and substitute Stephen O'Neill kicked one. But um, like I thought, Port Arlington in the first half, their kick passing was superb. Like you mm. know, there was the mark, like, you have to applaud for a moment the mark that Colin Murphy took. Where oh. it was absolutely drilled head height. It was unbelievable how he managed to hold on to it. Like, but I just thought in the second half, maybe they were forcing that kick pass a little bit when you, you probably just had to try and run it a bit more. Now, maybe they didn't have the energy for it, like, but they just weren't getting that joy um, that they were like when they were breaking so quickly in the first half. Yeah, like they're a really good team. And one of the <laughs> really big, good, yeah. One of the great things with all this TV coverage at the moment is you're getting exposure to more and more teams that you mightn't have seen before. And I know the hurling was obviously a bit of a blowout on Sunday, but and I was tweeting it afterwards, but like the club stuff that we've seen on TV has been so good and so dramatic. All these concerns about a split season, like fair enough, people might say you're not fully getting, you know, the commercial sort of, uh, or exploring this thing commercially uh, as much as you could if it was inter-county for more of the year. But in terms of entertainment and in terms of like people buying into club, I think it's only going to grow from here. Yeah, like I'm, I suppose I'm conscious in this situation that I feel like kind of already converted in this argument, you know, and like there are people who just, you kind of hear their concerns. Like it's obviously just in DJ Carey's thing last week that he said, look, I'd be into hurling and all that, but I just wouldn't really be interested in following club hurling in Cork or Gold or whatever first either in the county side. So people do have kind of concerns, but I think the exposure and the storylines um, have really helped. And in fairness, look, a long time you've got a lot of TG Car for the coverage and it is outstanding, but I do think the addition of RTE on the Saturday, um, and I know they've been doing it before, but it, it feels like this winter, I don't know, it's kind of caught hold or something. You know, some of the games they've had have been brilliant, like the Clock Balacala one. Um, even Saturday now, the two of them you might have thought beforehand these are going to be kind of blowouts for yeah. Kildare and Dublin. The folks, that was another, like, Sorry, yeah, that's another one, yeah, yeah. Even like the Kerry semi final was. Uh, Low scoring, a bit grim, but it was very exciting at the end with extra time and penalties with Austin Stacks winning, you know. So I think that definitely does help when you have a relentless kind of stream of uh, of games. Um, I suppose it'll be interesting next year to see how it goes with the with the other ends of being kind of front loaded and it all being kind of done by July, like you know. But you'd hope that it shows that there is the appetite there. But I, th- I think the standard has just improved. I think when you get to this stage with teams coming out of provincial championships. Like the level of coaching, the level of detail, like the level of conditioning. Um, you know, you take a club like Port Arlington, okay, they won the first county title in 20 years in August from last year. They then retain it. They then go forward to beat an established club like St. Lomans, we're used to seeing in Leinster. And then they run Kilmacook Rokes, who, you know, probably are probably the favourites for Leinster from the outright to two points. Like, you know, um, for a club like that, you'd imagine, you know, great to see if they come, come back next year and win a leash and kind of come back again because. Um, definitely a lot of kind of very exciting players in their in their ranks, you know. And do you know what? Even like you mentioned the RTE point, I think that's huge because for people who don't speak Irish, I think sometimes watching uh, a game on TG Cahar, brilliant coverage. Don't get me wrong, but I just talk about the odd person might be I don't speak Irish, and it's a little bit off putting to them. So I think the fact that it's on RTE also and it's in English actually helps. But uh, certainly in no way, shape, or form am I doing down TG Carter there because their coverage is absolutely brilliant. Uh, you were in Parky Rin yesterday to see St. Finbars against Sayer Oak. Two 14 to 12 points in the in the wind-up. I think it was uh, down man Conor McCrickard with a couple of goals there. Did it kind of follow predictable enough lines where Finbars were always just going to be that bit better? Um, yeah, I, I gave Sayer Oak a serious chance coming into this. But, like, if they'd been at home, I think I would definitely would have. I mean, I sent some beforehand. Like, I mean, Cork, Cork and Clare are pretty much at a level similar enough standing at the county level at the moment 
And I mean, it all started with four county footballers and another guy, Aaron Fitzgerald, who would have been playing up until this year and is now on the hurling um, setup. And then David Reedy was a Clare senior hurler. So that's a lot of experience in their team, even though obviously they hadn't been in Munster in uh, 15 years. They beat Lockmore Castle Lightning, so it showed that they obviously were taking the provincial thing seriously. Um, they had a massive attendance came down with them, you know, like very kind of a noisy group. You could tell it was a big thing for them, kind of, you know, go back to your point uh, before with the away day uh, provincial experience, you know, they definitely seemed to kind of enjoy it in terms of the reaction they gave the team when they came out onto the field. But um, got off to a great start, but just ultimately undone. I don't know if you've seen the, the, the clubber.e uh, Twitter account put out the, the goals today. Just undone, but kind of two moments, and particularly the first one, completely just fell asleep. Everyone expected Stephen Sherlock to just put the ball over the bar for a 20 yard free. And we look at it, everyone is kind of pushed out, and it's just the keeper in. And basically, McCricker just makes a dark inside, and the free is put into him, and he puts it in the net. And that left him up one, two to three points at the water break, so you immediately have a big boost. And then uh, it was a pretty hard hitting game four black cards, one pair sent off, six yellows. Not very dirty or anything like that, you know, and some of the black cards were kind of questionable, but you know, it was it was very hard hitting. So like St. Finbar's lost Ian McGuire, be kind of their big driving force and their captain um to a black card. And he sensed this was the time for a rogue to kind of capitalize. But instead they got outscored one three to a point when he was off the field. McCricker getting a second goal, a lovely delivery, he ghosted in behind the full back line. So like nine points away from home was a huge R thing. And like you just got the sense of the second half, as long as St. Finbars didn't concede a goal, they'd be okay. And now, hey, Rogue made a serious burst for like Kieran Russell, you know, he's the clear football fullback. He's coming back, he was brilliant, like and kind of driving forward from deep. And uh, Colonel Hannafane, who would be another one that be involved with clear seniors. So, like, they got the, they got back to four at one stage, like it's Paul O'Keefe, the Bars manager said afterwards, they kind of did their traditional kind of third quarter fade out. But then, repeat myself, you know, you, you want your attacking guy to stand up, then and Stephen Sherlock just kicks the last four points of the game. Uh, brilliant point from play when they needed it and okay three of them were from freeze but two of them were pretty much the last kicks again they were almost out in the touch line 13 yards out on the right side for a right footed kicker if you know what I mean but he still managed to kind of curl them over so um, yeah the Bears look they deserve the victory and all that but in fairness <clears throat> they rolled maybe eight points is a little bit of a a bit of a bit misleading in terms of uh, the gap that it suggests that exists between the two sides you know yeah, Michal McCart- uh, McCarthy here is saying the Bears' accuracy and shooting efficiency was very good. Yeah, I believe they had only just one wide. Yeah, and they had two po- two uh, two short. So that was an absolutely unbelievable kind of return. And uh, like two thirteen of their tally came from their full forward line. So you know, I've had long talk about Sherlock and kind of this pod, like, but I mean, Conor Cricker, the, the the down guy who's joined them, he got two one, and then Killian Myers Murray. Um, you know, his dad, Phil Murray, would have played for Cork in the in the nineties and two thousands. He got three points in play. And he's just a lovely kicker of a ball when he kind of gets that space off his right foot. So um, sometimes you think maybe they should play a little bit more direct than they did without the when they're actually down to 14 minutes for that time. You know, sometimes they run the ball a little bit. You think if they kind of just kind of beat the retreating defense like and play the foot pass a bit more often that they could really cause havoc inside. But um, probably a good thing for them going into the Munster final with all the kind of talk with Sherlock that the other two guys alongside him. Um, you know, the, you, you're going to need obviously a more kind of varied attacking threat if you're going to win a provincial final um, at this stage of the season. But uh, just the other one actually who's kind of standing out for them at the moment is Billy Hennessy, Cork Hurler. I think yeah. he's been actually uh, let go it's now. I think in the in the panel uh, changes for 2022, but will be involved in 2021. I think he only really rejoined the St. Finbar's football squad when Paris got knocked out of the hurling championship. I wouldn't have seen him play much football before this, but he's really really effective. Uh, like you said, physically very kind of dominating. Um, just very good at sweeping around the fence, and he's been a big, big addition um, to their backline. Um, I think the big thing for the Bears was a little bit of redemption. You know, as the manager said afterwards, like they just got absolutely hammered out the gate by Dr. Crokes in 2018, 520 to 111 or 112 or something like that. Like he said, we spoke after the county final that we let ourselves down. So, you know, he said we can't do anything about that game now, and this doesn't exactly completely make up for it. Like, you know, but at least, you know, if, if it was kind of zero for two for this group. In Munster Club, you know, that'd be a little bit of a disappointment after winning two county titles. But at least now they've won against a good air rogue side and the challenge is going to get greater now the next day. But uh it's quite an interesting uh Munster final now ahead. Yeah, what a glorious pass they had. Like the only th- club in the country to win all Ireland's in both codes and a first mm. Munster final since 1986. They're going to be up against Austin Stacks. But like, do you think Barris have the quality to to get to Crow Park this year? Uh 
Crow Park, but I suppose, uh, do you mean the other club semi-finals are going to be in Crow Park in the final? Because I suppose you're looking at it like it's going to be Munster v Ulster and, and after yesterday, you know, Kilku's obviously status is just going to drop it up now having uh, jumped out Glenn. Um, I think the thing about the Munster final, I think both sides are similar in that neither will fear each other. And what I mean by that is that like Dr. Crooks and Nemo at different stages have kind of cast such a shadow over their respective county championships and the Munster championship over the last two decades. And Stacks and Bars respectively have suffered against their counterparts uh, in the county. And then, like I mentioned, Bars getting hammered by Crooks, Stacks got hammered by Nemo in 2019 as well. So there's an element of a once a year beaten before you, you know what I mean? Like, like a team going out against Ballyhale and Hurling or whatever, there is that little bit of a, you wonder does that mental thing creep in? I wouldn't say Finn Bars will have that fear of Stacks. I wouldn't say Stacks will have that kind of fear of Bars. Uh, I think it's going to be a neutral venue, possibly to get a grounds, I think, where it's going to be on. Um, I think both view it as a big, big opportunity. Like Stacks will probably start as favourites. I mean, the thing about them, they're just defensively probably one of the best sides left in the championship. Like they can see so little and it's so well organised. And signs upon two two of their defenders in midfield are getting added to Jack O'Connor's carry squad last week, which I think is a kind of reflection of their uh, their capabilities. But uh, the are, they're moving nicely. Uh, they have, like the thing about them, they have a load of what I would call kind of seven or ten players, like loads, like and even guys coming off the bench. And then they have the kind of X factor, Maguire and Sherlock are the two. And then yesterday, I suppose the good aspect for them was that uh, they kind of two other um, kind of scoring threats, you know. Um, mm. Scheduling wise, I actually think maybe it's a night bit the way it works out that the Munster final is on before Christmas. Leave a few weeks to just kind of park that and just kind of get yourself energized again. Um, 16th of January, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a nice break for them, you know. But definitely the one thing I did think about them yesterday, even like Michael Shields started, that was his first time starting a lot uh, game in a while because he had a bit of an injury difficulty. Just you know, the experience that he kind of brings to it in terms of moving the ball around set forward and all that. But uh, they definitely look ambitious and they kind of want to have a good crack off Munster now, whereas. I think in 2018, it was the first time they won a county in 33 years. I think they went out a week or two later against Stockton Crokes, you know. Um, mm. It was it was a fair old step up as they found out that day in McLarney. Yeah, I was kind of saying that Newcastle West plus five against Austin Stacks was a decent bet. I was very wrong there. It was 115 to eight points. Uh, Brendan O'Sullivan got a goal in the 42nd minute and that kind of killed off the game. And Stacks did it without Ronan Shanahan and Shane O'Callaghan. Uh, Joe O'Connor very good at midfield. And the first provincial final for them since winning it against uh, Denier in 2014 so like Stax obviously have the quality you, I mean I look at Stax and haven't watched that Kerry semi-final on TV I definitely wasn't blown away but uh, maybe I'm just not seeing that you know they, they have that defence that you've talked about they obviously have a lot of metal too like maybe they can keep this run going yeah, look, at fairness, so I was at the Kerry County final and I would have watched that semi final you referenced on TV. And the performance was a big time improved from that in terms of their kind of attacking output. Um, I mean, Sean Quilter started yesterday. He, I think, is a big att- attacking addition. Like, he's very, very, you know, he's a young player, but he's like physically imposing. And obviously, you have him next to Donaghy and then Daryl Bryan kicked eight points yesterday. He's a very, very good free taker, you know. So they just have a lot of, again, it's not going to, the X factor when you, you know when you used up the Dr. Crokes team a couple of years ago and it was like nearly six Kerry seniors, you know, Con Cooper, Tony Roslin, uh Keith or Kieran O'Leary, you know, it was just all kind of all star stuff in the forward line. They don't kind of have that thing that would immediately kind of grab you like, but they're very well organized. I mean, their manager Wayne Quillen would have a big basketball background and they just remind me of that, the way they kind of shut off the, the attacking lanes and all that, and the way they're kind of so well drilled at the back. Um and I think there's an element as well for them. Like, you know, they only lost by a point to Shock Neil in that all-earned semi-final. And, okay, they haven't won a county since, but they've won three of the Kerry club championships. And, I mean, last year would have been knockout in Kerry. They lost the Croaks after extra time. Again, I'd say it would be a pretty ambitious group and would be feeling that, you know, now is their time to, to kind of strike. It's been so hard to get out of their county. Similarly, St. Finbars would have a similar kind of an ethos, I imagine, that, you know, we've been waiting so long to win these counties. And, you know, you're probably hearing the stories of kind of teams of old. Um, I mean, I was looking at these the, the clubs that have kind of met a good, frankly enough in the 70s and 80s. They played each other in the 76 months of club final, you know. That kind of element of history is kind of there, which, I mean, before 2014, I don't think Stocks have won it since 92 or 93, you know. Um, so no more than Eamon Callaghan impressing on the Nays players. You imagine someone like Donaghy is saying to the younger Stocks guys, you know, strike while the iron's hot now, you know. Um, and, like, whoever gets over Munster, you know, uh, 
you'd imagine Kilku, you still go, you know, you're going to imagine they're going to be favourites to win Ulster, and you're probably they're going to be favourites on that side of the draw now to, to get the All Ireland Club final. But whoever gets out of Munster or whoever gets out of Munster, that's a big uh, kind of a feat for them. And uh, you imagine they fancy a crack off from them, you know? Yeah, there was plenty of games on different in uh, all the different grades, but uh, I couldn't help but notice Ballina of Tipperary against Mount Zion. <laughs> You know, Ozzy Gleason's Mount Zion. So that was 16 points to 2-5 to the Tipperary team there, true. Uh, a bit of a nasty first quarter there where three inter-county players were all issued um, cards. Uh, Stephen O'Brien got a red for a shoulder charge, I think, after about 30 seconds. Uh, Con- uh, Connors, I'm not sure what Connors' first name is, uh, which Connors it is. And Ozzy Gleason got uh, yellow. I think it's Willie, Willie Connors. So I-, I was wondering, was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you you will probably not as better than me, but I'd like to kill an angle not have a football side now because him and uh, I think it's Dan O'Mara. Um yeah, who Dan O'Mara played, who played tip under twenty, didn't he? Maybe senior, like you know, they both seem to be playing uh, football for Bala. So um obviously Connors has played underage football for tips, so that's uh, two two big kind of additions to their ranks, yeah. you know. There aren't too many clubs in, in North Tipperary that are too bothered in football, which made it all yeah. the more uh, odd to see this game on in Burris Ali. Um, but uh, actually, Thomas Conway was tweeting about it, saying, Balna book a Munster final uh, spot following a game which shifted between the ugly and the sublime. Tip club exuded confidence at times and were ultimately the better side. They were going to play, uh, our, our play against Miva Gila of Kerry in the final, who beat uh, Boher Bui by 3.14 to 9 points. But uh, as you mentioned, the Ulster semi-finals there. I was watching the Derry Gunnelly Harps against Clan Aaron game on Saturday evening, 3.11 to 1.11. Like a first, a first Ulster um, club final for Derry Gonley Harps. It feels like they've been knocking on the door forever, doesn't it? Yeah, because in fairness, you, you, that's the start. You look, you know, you look at it like they've never been in Ulster final before, and you, you think it's this big break tube. When you kind of look deeper, you know, they've had a couple of semi finals. Um, lost to Kevin Gales, I think, after extra time, was it by a point one year? Uh, then I think it was maybe Shot Neil. Um, one of the other years, you know, so they've been in two semi finals. Um, experience of kind of getting to a province and just on a county level they're also dumping out to Tyrone and our match champions like you know so that's uh you know you think in county terms you know that's I know Tyrone haven't had the best record in the last couple of years but still um to beat you more after extra time in in uh in Tyrone was a uh, was fair going you know and obviously to back it up but obviously the start of the game I only just flicked over uh at the point where I saw a zero zero to three two so, <laughs> it was nuts. You know, what's going on here but uh just read the kind of reports like yeah, it just seemed like they just poured through uh I will in that first six or seven minutes, you know, and got the three goals. It was it was mad stuff. Uh Shane McGullion, he ended up getting man of the match and he got a couple of those goals early on. Connell Jones got one as well. And I think that the red card probably I think it was Shane I'm not entirely sure who got sent off uh off the top of my head. I'm sure I have it. Oh Stephen McGullion got sent off with two yellow cards leading up to half time. I thought that was a little bit harsh. And Sean McCarthy had a dangerous shoulder on Shane McGullion late on. And, you know, obviously that's, I think that stopped the comeback. But they had it back, I think, within four points. To go 3-2 to, uh, to zero down and to come back to within four is a fair effort from Clan Aaron. Uh, Kilku against Glenn, that was on TV last night. It was, uh, it was some stuff, like, to be fair, I did fancy Glenn. But once the game got going, I started to think, it was a real reminder of how good Kilku were, are and how unlucky they were to not win the All-Ireland a couple of years ago. Yeah, I thought it was... It was absorbing, you know. I mean, I know it was low score and all that, and I know it's not everyone's kind of cup of tea, but I kind of really enjoyed watching the for the the defer coverage of it. Like, you know, it it just even looking at the athletic grounds, the whole stand nearly full uh, on the Sunday before Christmas. You know, it had that kind of heavyweight feel to it. You know, um, I'd say Kilku felt a little bit slighted with the way all the talk about Glenn over the last couple of weeks. You know, almost putting them as all Ireland favourites. Now, look, in fairness, it was unbelievably impressive. What they did uh, to Scottstown and obviously winning away to St. Eunan's, um, you know, the Mike Rourke factor, having Connor Glass available in midfield, and maybe it felt that all this kind of underage talent that was bubbling away in uh, in Derry over the last while and winning also minor titles and all that was finally come to fruition at senior level. But um, yeah, you, it's true what you say, you do just kind of need to be reminded of the, the stature of Kilku in terms of you know, all our club finalists, regular right? county final winners in down. Um, I thought actually just like go back to the coaching thing when the camera panned on one of the water breaks that, or maybe it was extra time like you know some level of management now at that level of club level when you Mickey Moran taking one uh, team huddle and Malik were taking the other you know I mean it's it really is at that level just below in, into county isn't it like you know it's it's unbelievable um, stuff like but it was always felt like you know a goal probably wasn't going to come and then when it came it just came from a mistake like you know and if there's I do think you have to give Jerome Johnson a believable credit for the way he kind of shaped up 
I presume he would kind of step inside, you know, and take the shot. But the way he took it on, probably only going to get half a chance in a, or half a second in a game uh, to get a shot off like that. But I mean, he's some finisher, you know, he got an unbelievable goal against Ramar United in the last game. So, and I think once that went in, you thought, you know, they'll just squeeze the life out of this and they just won't let uh, concede another goal. Um, but I, I thought some of the points, like scores are so hard earned in the game. And some of the points, like last one, unbelievable one from play, Mihal Rooney, a couple for Kilku, Paul Evans, free taking, you know. But uh, yeah, feels like a massive win for Kilku, a side who are kind of on the go for over a decade. I know they've only won Ulster, but in terms of trying to, to get that Ulster and, and all Ireland titles, uh, it feels like a major step forward. Now, in fairness, I saw the Derry Valley manager making the point after he goes all week. I was thinking, I was hearing that the de facto All Ireland final was taking place on Sunday in an Ulster semi, and realizing that we had a game to play on Saturday, like you know. But and and they are experienced enough, and you know, I know it's their first final, but they've been around the province a good bit, like you know. But you imagine after that, Kilku, uh, they will be like, they will be favourites to to kind of get the job done and win their second provincial title in uh, in January. Are they your favourites for the All Ireland? I think it probably will be now, yeah. Just on the yeah, experience basis. Yeah, I mean, it, like whoever comes out once they're, um, you're looking at not more important Pierce as well. Like you know, whoever wins there is going to be going to be a, a, a kind of a big, a big thing as well. Like, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, eight that we're left with now. You know, in terms of, uh, I was looking through it. Like, so Stacks have won a province province in 2014. Kilmacud having twenty last in 2010. And then Kilku were the, the only kind of recent All Ireland finalists, you know. So you're putting Kilku favourites on the back of that, and obviously beating a highly rated kind of Glen side. But you imagine there's a lot of clubs looking around, and there isn't the fear factor of a, you know, Curra Fane, Shock Neil, Dr. Crooks, Nemo, that kind of thing, you know, going around. Like, you know, they say there's a lot of sides kind of pretty happy that they got their job done over the last couple of weekends in provincial semi final wins and kind of look forward to January now and um, the finals, you know. The, um, the point you made there about the quality of the management teams, to me, I think it's going to end up where, you know, a good quality manager is going to have two jobs on the go at all times. One is going to be club, one is going to be county, and maybe they'll just have a light impact during the club league situation. And once the inter-county is over, they'll come back full board. Uh, do you see that being the situation now where, you know, a Maliki or Ork or whatever is going to have both a club and a county? I mean, I'm just picking him as an example. Obviously, I don't know what he's going to do, but that, that will happen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Like the, the fact that this preseason kind of enables it. Um, the topic I was chatting during the year before Clare played Tip and it was their hurling championship with uh, Brian Lawler, the Kiladangan, then Kiladangan manager, about Sean Tracy, how it was working, the fact that he was coaching Clare and got up against a lot of the Kiladangan lads. But like, Brian himself would have managed Kildare and hurling. So he was just making the point that he just think it's completely doable now because of the split season. And they had a system, I think, during the county championship. Tracy was with them one night a week on Wednesday. And then, uh, then I suppose once the clear season was going to be over, he was going to be with them full time. And you know they got as far as the county semi final, so it wasn't exactly a terrible year from their uh, their standards at all. But he was just making the point; he just thinks it's completely doable from now on. When it was being kind of done a bit before, players would have felt a bit slighted. You know, the couple of examples that we would have seen where guys were juggling both. Um, but I mean, if the All Ireland is over on the thirty first of January next year. Or sorry, July next, sorry, 24th of July is it? I think the, the football is down for. Um, and the hurling, you know, a couple weeks beforehand. If you're a quality club hurling football coach, you imagine running then, you know, you might get roped in with a different club when you're looking into the autumn of uh, County Championship. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting that kind of merry go round. You know, there's been a couple of rumors, not I haven't heard anything finalized, you know, but kind of different stuff and tip and different counties like that. And, you know, the high profile nature of guys uh, kind of coming on stream. Um, and you wonder, will they start approaching guys like that who are involved with county teams and maybe say, look, just give us a small bit of a dig out in the first couple of months. We understand, you know, our club guys will kind of run the show mainly, but then we'll have you full time from, you know, if you ever say the club players, we have this really high profile coach who's with X county and he'll be with us full time from the August bank holiday weekend, uh, you know, three nights a week or whatever. I think it's a pretty enticing prospect for a group of players. Yeah, as a club player, I think you'd be, tipping away, doing, you know, doing your best, obviously, during the year, but there'll probably be a real momentum or focus shift as soon as, you know, that quality county manager or county coach comes in. It'll be like, OK, now it's go time. And obviously, only two teams can get to an All-Ireland final. A lot of teams are going to be out, you know, before you even get to July, so those coaches are going to be uh, available that bit earlier. Uh, a reminder, please do subscribe to the channel. Press the button in the bottom right-hand corner, patreon.com forward slash our game to support the channel five or a month. If you want those audio podcasts and uh, please do support orgaretro.com 
15% off with the promo code our game and a great place to get a, a Christmas present. You probably want to get yourself a nice little cork one. Or would you be going more with your your, uh, your father's blood and getting a Tipperary jersey? I'll stick with my native uh, county where, where I'm spending most of my life living in China. You know? So I'll stick with the cork one for that, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's the last show before Christmas. So, Finton, best of luck with the Christmas and I'll chat to you in the new year. Cheers, Shane. Happy Christmas to you.